Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Nons SL660, a fully analog manual SLR camera designed for Fujifilm's Instax Square Film. Now, I enjoy instant photography, but Fujifilm's recent analog cameras, like the SQ40 here, are mostly automatic, lacking any manual override for when you want to get more creative. Luckily, a number of third party cameras have become available for those who desire more control over things like the focus, the exposure, and even the choice of lenses while still using standard Instax film cartridges. At the time I made this video, Nons offered a pair of SLR cameras with full manual exposure control and passive EF lens mounts, allowing you to fit any compatible or adapted lens. The SL645 body costs around £435 and uses Instax Minifilm, while the SL660 costs £482 and uses Instax Square Film. Both are sold via their website at nonscamera.com. I'll put a link in the description. The SL660 is a pretty substantial camera, although place it alongside the SQ40 and you'll see it shares a similar width and height, albeit obviously being thicker due to a lens that doesn't fold into the body when not in use. The really big physical difference though is build quality, with the SL660's anodized aluminium body, stainless steel dial and wooden grip giving it a significant step up over the mostly plastic Fujifilm cameras. But these materials unsurprisingly also make it much heavier, with the SL660 and 35 2.4 lens weighing in over double the SQ40, and that makes it a camera to carry around in a bag rather than a large pocket. Round the back you'll find a power switch, a USB-C port for charging the internal battery, and a button to eject the print. Now since this eject button is independent from the main shutter release, it's possible to easily capture multiple exposures on a single print and only eject it when you're ready. On the top is a shutter dial with speeds from 250th of a second to 1 second in one stop increments, along with a bulb mode which keeps the shutter open while the main release button is pushed in. You'll notice a tiny display sandwiched between the shutter dial and the viewfinder head which works alongside a built-in light meter. Together, these suggest an appropriate aperture for whatever shutter speed you've selected on the dial. Now remember, as a fully manual camera, the SL660 won't be setting the aperture for you, so the displayed value here is only a suggestion. The light meter is also positioned above the lens, so it's not actually metering the light coming into and through the lens, and it won't know, say, if the lens cap's been left on or your fingers in front of it. The mini display also indicates the battery life and the shots remaining in the cartridge. The battery should be good for around 100 shots, but you'll need to recharge via a USB-A adapter as it won't support fast USB-C to C charging, so they supply it with a C to A cable. Oh, and while there's no built-in flash, that is a hot shoe atop the viewfinder head, and that allows you to synchronize with compatible flash guns at up to 250th of a second. On either side of the lens mount on the front are two satisfyingly mechanical controls, the viewfinder slider on the right, which primes the camera to shoot, and the shutter release button on the left. The circular top to the shutter release can be unscrewed to fit a threaded cable release if you prefer, perhaps for those bulb exposures, although do beware this cap can fall off in general use if not screwed on tight. You can still use the camera without it though. The SL660 and SL645 employ a Canon EF bayonet, allowing them to mount any compatible lens, not to mention Nikon F, Pentax K, Contax Yashica or M42 lenses via optional adapter rings. As a passive mount though, there's no electronic control over aperture or focus. So if you were to fit, say, an EF lens with no aperture ring, like my old EF85 1.8 USM here, it's only going to operate with its maximum aperture. So that's 1.8 in this case. As such, you're best off mounting or adapting older 35mm film lenses with aperture rings and mechanical focusing, or using the fully manual 35mm 2.4 or 50mm 1.8 lenses from NONS itself, costing £88 or £48 respectively. I use the 35mm 2.4 for my tests, as well as trying out my own Canon EF85 1.8. Now since the Instax formats are much larger than 35mm or full frame sensors though, both of these SLRs employ built-in focal reducing optics to roughly deliver the same coverage. So, a lens that's designed for full frame or 35mm film cameras will deliver approximately the same field of view when mounted on one of these non-SLRs. 
Some lenses will, however, suffer from vignetting or darkening in the corners, and others, especially longer ones, may even reveal a square mask around the edges. So NONS recommends lenses in the range of 28 to 58 mil on the SL660, but instant analog photography is rarely a precise science and unexpected artifacts are part of the charm, right? Okay, so to get shooting, first charge up the camera, then fit an Instax square cartridge in the rear compartment. There's no alignment guide, so position the yellow mark on the back of the cartridge in the lower right corner. Next, switch the camera on, and if you're using a brand new cartridge, you'll first need to eject the disposable safety sheet, so push and hold the eject button on the back for a couple of seconds to do so. After this, push down the viewfinder lever to prepare the camera to shoot. Then compose the shot through the viewfinder, manually focus the lens, then adjust the shutter speed and lens aperture for the desired exposure. You could use the built-in meter for guidance, or try your own better meter if you have one, or simply base your exposure on a typical value for these conditions. Remember that Instax film has a sensitivity of 800 ISO. Then push down on the shutter button to take the shot, after which you should push and hold the eject button on the back for a couple of seconds to eject the print. And again, if you want to make a multiple exposure, just reprime the viewfinder lever and reshoot as many times as you like before ejecting when you're done. Now, as your first print from the SL660 gradually fades into view, two things will become apparent. Most obviously, the print will have captured a much broader field of view than the viewfinder showed you when you composed it. And secondly, the wider white border on the print will be positioned on the left side rather than the bottom, if you're holding the camera normally or you have it mounted atop a tripod. Dealing with the first issue, the SL660 may be an SLR with angled mirrors inside to reflect the light from the lens into the viewfinder, but they're not actually large enough to deliver anywhere near the full field of view. This becomes obvious the moment you compose as the viewfinder shows a rectangular image, but of course the output is square. To be fair, an SLR with a square mirror to deliver the full view would make this camera considerably thicker, heavier and more expensive, so Nons decided on a simpler approach. With no film loaded and the rear door open, you can see how it works. Pushing the main lever down lowers the viewfinder optics between the lens and the film, and it's clear how it's only able to peek at a portion of the image. When you push the shutter release button, this unit pops upwards to clear the optical path and uses a leaf style shutter in the built-in optics to actually make the exposure. It's barely visible here at the fastest speed of 250th of a second, so here it is again at 15th, where you may see the shutter blink and now for a one second exposure where the shutter opening and closing becomes more obvious. The other thing that's obvious is the sound of this mechanism. Now the leaf shutter may be quiet, but the viewfinder mechanism getting out of the way makes for a substantial clunk, which I actually personally enjoyed, although it's not exactly discreet. Either way, it's this design approach that allows the SL660 to not only mount, but focus any lens that you attach without the body becoming too thick. The SLR viewfinder lets you focus with the actual lens, while also previewing the depth of field depending on the selected aperture value, although it is easiest to focus with the aperture wide open, so I tended to do that before closing it down to the desired exposure. But again, this simpler design means that the viewfinder will not show you anywhere near the full view that you're capturing, so some imagination is required to compensate. Here's a photo I took through the viewfinder showing the actual view while I was composing on the left and the actual final print that I got on the right, where it's clear how much crop the viewfinder is. If you're holding the camera horizontally, you're going to have to expect a great deal of extra headroom above the viewfinder, but also a bit more all around it too. Also remember with the camera held this way around, the thicker blank border on the print will be on the left side. So if you prefer this thicker portion to be below the image, you'll need to turn the camera by 90 degrees counterclockwise. And when it's this way around, most of that extra headroom will now be to the left of the viewfinder. This all takes some getting used to, and ironically the basic optical viewfinder on a simpler Fujifilm Instax camera can actually give a better idea of the overall composition, albeit without the SLR focusing or the chance to fit other lenses. Now framing and print orientation may have been my initial issues, but I also had some exposure worries. Since the built-in meter isn't measuring the light coming in through the lens, it should be used as a basic guide only. I often found that bright reflective objects like white buildings in direct sunlight could become overexposed using the suggested metering, while dimly lit interiors could actually become underexposed. 
but unlike Fujifilm's analog cameras, there's plenty of exposure latitude at either end of this scale if you need to adjust. Again, the trick is to learn the foibles of the built-in metering system and compensate for it, deliberately under or overexposing the values it suggests under conditions that you know previously tripped it up. Or of course, just use a more sophisticated light meter or even the recommendation from a separate camera. But with this many gotchas, why use the SL660 instead of a mostly automatic Fujifilm Instax camera? The answer is having full manual control over the exposure and being able to not just fit different lenses, but control their focus and the depth of field. I've personally found Fujifilm's analog Instax cameras often overexpose bright outdoor landscape scenes, but once you've mastered the metering on the SL660, it's possible to not only achieve a balanced exposure, but even deliberately underexpose outdoor scenes for creative effects. Plus, you could always fit a filter on the end of the lens if you want to use larger apertures in daytime too for shallow depth of field effects, although you would need to manually factor that into your exposure. Again, the metering system is not going to know anything about any filters that you mount. Meanwhile, with a bulb option, you could even attempt long exposures on this camera, and again, there's a chance to fit a flash if you desire. In terms of depth of field, it really is possible to achieve some blurring with large apertures, even at f2.4 on the 35mm NONS lens. First time SLR users or those who wear glasses may find it a bit tricky to nail the precise focus using the viewfinder screen, but the experience isn't a world apart from many old 35mm film SLRs. It's something you get used to over time. As promised, I also tried my old EF 85mm 1.8 lens, and again, in the absence of an aperture ring, it became f1.8 only. But that's how I wanted to use it, right? So here's a shot on the left with the NONS 35 2.4 at f2.4, while on the right is the EF 85 1.8 at f1.8, both showing the potential for bokeh blobs and becoming the envy of any analog Fujifilm Instax camera. And for portraits, here's the 35 2.4 on the left and the 85 1.8 on the right, again both at their maximum apertures, showing some blurring in the background, albeit the latter also exhibiting substantial vignetting. Indeed, throughout my time with the SL660 I found many of my shots were darker in the corners than expected or displayed other artefacts, but that's mostly down to the combination of a particular lens and the built-in focal reducing optics. Couple this with my metering challenges and a viewfinder that only shows a small portion of the view that you're actually going to capture, and it's fair to say that this is not a camera for exacting photographers or those who demand predictable results. If you want an instant analog SLR camera with precise composition, one option could be to fit an old Hasselblad 500 series with a back that takes instant film. And as luck would have it, NONS makes one of those too. Ultimately though, the SL660 is designed for analog lovers who want the challenge and creative opportunities of manual metering and focus the chance to adapt to a variety of lenses, and crucially capture images that genuinely look different to those from a simple Fujifilm analog body. It may not be for you personally, but I love that a number of third parties are now providing interesting alternatives to shooting with instant film. That said, I'm still not letting Fujifilm off the hook and will sign off with my usual request that they also make a series of analog Instax cameras with more creative control. Just look at the Polaroid i2 if you need any further inspiration. Oh, and don't forget your wide format either. And that's it for this review. If you're an instant photographer, or indeed an SLR owner, would you be tempted by a camera like this, or are you looking for a different experience? Tell me in the comments what kind of instant camera you're looking for. And remember, if you just want a simple, cheaper Fujifilm camera or printer, I've got reviews of all of them on my channel. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.